it was very funny. I did another uh, series on Sci-Fi Channel called Mission Genesis. Um, and my first day on that, sci-fi, I, I came to set and I had to crawl around in a conduit and fix some wires. Um, and then uh, I came to do Andromeda years later. My first day on set on Andromeda, I had to crawl around in a conduit and fix some wires. <laughs> and it was very, very funny. Especially having seen, since, since then, seen Galaxy Quest, where Sigourney Weaver in Galaxy Quest crawls around in a conduit, and she has a line like, conduits, why is it always conduits? There seems to be something inherent to sci-fi. You always end up in a little tiny conduit fixing some wires. So it, that was, that was a, the big first impression for me. I had a little laugh to myself. Ironically enough, now Sci-Fi Channel is part of uh, Andromeda years the later. So. Thing we do Full circle. How are we going to spend our money? Let me guess. A little cottage by the lakeshore, white picket fence, dog. All the traditional mud foot accessories. Not even close. I have one word for you two. Seraglio. Uh, sir what? Seraglio. Slave girls and grapes. Unit guards. Classy. When the show began, everybody was really confident about it going five years. So, <clears throat> you know, I've always been more pragmatic. I was a little more doubtful, but it's Gene Roddenberry. And, you know, in the same token, I was a big Star Trek fan. And so I was also extremely excited about it and uh, hopeful. And now here we are five years later, so, so it's great. It's who the hell are you and what are you doing on my ship? Your ship. No, 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 this baby's ours. We salvaged it fair and square. Finders keepers. I think, you know, one of the main things that has kept this show afloat is me. Um, you know, I think without Harper, there would be no Andromeda. <laughs> I, think, you know, I think it's, you know, it's, it's hard as an actor. You're so biased and you feel very proud of your cast and your, your actors and you say, well, it's the actors, it's the cast. We make the show, it's the characters. But really, television does come down to characters. And so, you know, if the writers are keeping those characters alive and dynamic and the actors are honoring those dynamics and, and adding more to it without um, crossing lines that you set up ahead of time and so that the audience can rely on you to, to be those characters every week, then they'll come back to hang out with the people they've gotten to know. So uh, where are we going, boss? The hologram was a map. And not one like I've ever seen before. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Wait a minute, how come I get to go for a change? Because I want you with me. This is something shady, isn't it? Here. This show, for me personally, was sort of like the culmination of a kind of a character that I had already created. And I kind of fit that character into this mold. You know, when you, as an actor, you can do lots. But I, I don't think you can, and I don't think you should, try to be everything. You know, actors that say, I can do this, I can do that. You're just spreading yourself thin. I think you have to get to know your four or five best characters or best aspects about yourself that you can really portray. This is one of them. Harper, and I think for me it's been exploring that one, that one side of my personality or that one character that I developed and, and so it's been a real journey of, um, of not limitations and restrictions but when you set up a sort of set of conditions that you force yourself to stick to, you discover a lot of neat things within that framework. It, it forces creativity to have ingenuity. Harper, are you sure this is wise? You barely understand this technology. If it doesn't I work, know, I know. it'll twist me into an abstract painting. Harper, descending staircase. <laughs> okay, this isn't a joke. No, it's not. I know. But the way I see it, Rami, I got nothing to lose. The humor with Harper is not the kind of humor, humor that, that, are, that exists in sitcoms where sometimes the cast, the characters, are not supposed to be aware of the jokes they're making. You know, it's supposed to be situation comedy. Harper is. Harper is the one making these jokes. It's not, you know, he's that type of a, that type of a sarcastic guy. And so the, the fans that do like my character love my character. And they'll come up to me at conventions and say, you're just like me. You're so sarcastic. You're so mouthy. You know, it's, he's ba Harper is based on the kid that I was in school, in high school, basically. Um, you know, I grew up and been matured a little bit from that. So it wasn't, but it wasn't, I didn't have to regress too far to find the character. <laughs> There's a big moron and a little moron sitting on a fence. And the big moron falls off. Why doesn't the little moron fall off? Because he's a little moron. He strikes me as like he might have a little bit of ADD. <laughs> well, I might have a little bit of ADD. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I think Harper does too, absolutely. And I try to, there is also, you know, I try not to do this too much, but it, there is some fun in technically challenge or challenging yourself, you know, trying to, um, trying to get those techno speeches out as quick as possible without, without um, eating them so that you don't understand what I'm saying, but so that you kind of feel like you've just been hit with a wall of techno speech and you're like, 
What did he just say? He started with your basic space elevator, comprised of carbon nanotube ropes with a dock that doubles as a counterweight. Child's play. I love that stuff. For me, it's, um, it has to make sense. Like, I don't come to set, I don't come to set memorizing the lines. I come to set, come to set learning what they mean. So that when I have to recall it, if I can't recall how it's written, I, I know what it means. So I can at least recall something and, and say what needs to be said. Um, and that's with the techno stuff. It always has to mean something to me. And then it's actually very easy. Think of it like a giant centrifuge. The faster it spins, the greater the centrifugal force. The greater the centrifugal force, the stronger the G-force is acting upon something trapped in the end of the bridge. But what is that something? A tachyon. A particle that moves faster than the speed of light. You want to use G-forces to slow a tachyon below the speed of light as per the unified theory, creating time dilation around it. Your problem is you don't know how to make a tachyon. You don't know what particle to use. The other side of Harper is his heart. He's a guy that has a very, very big heart. The flip side, the jokes, all that is a is a um, an armor, uh, a bit of um, a, a way to try and protect yourself so that that big heart doesn't get hurt, which it does. In those moments, we see that, oh, underneath there is a real sensitive young kid. I didn't grow up on Earth, but I understand how you no, must. You don't. Listen, I had two cousins, Declan and Siobhan. They were twins, actually, about my age. We grew up together, you know? We used to share between us whatever little scraps we could find. And then the Magog came. Harper has a dark past, and that's sort of what has built that armor that I was talking about that, you know, protects him. And I, Earth, the history of Earth is a very dark one. Nietzschean raids and Magog raids, they are enemies. And so it just became a big free-for-all. And Earth, we basically became collateral damage um, in, a, in a war between the Magog and Nietzscheans. And that's the backstory. So Harper saw a lot of death. Well, you know what they say about Earth, don't you? If I, if I had a place in hell and a place on Earth, I'd live in hell and I'd rent out the place on Earth. It wasn't always like that, though. The uh, scum of the Earth, low-life Nietzscheans, no offense, Rade, turned it into hell. The whole planet. Oh, Becca was his ticket off of Earth. So for Harper, Becca always has and always will represent sort of a sisterly relationship. Um, someone who he'll always back no matter what because she basically got him off the planet. Where would you rather be? Back on the Maru running cargo? Salvage? What makes you think that'd be any safer? It couldn't be any more dangerous. All right, you want to know what I think? Oh, good. Now for another chapter in the world according to Seamus Harper. Hey, my favorite book. Chapter 12, paragraph 8, verse 3. The universe hates you. Deal with it. That's comforting. It's still a sort of, a, you know, an existence of um, running cargo and, you know, the, the odd mishap here, maybe a thievery there, if a bit of scam here. Um, and so it's sort of been a slow climb level towards morality. And we still quite haven't gotten there for the character, but... <laughs> But uh, coming from where he comes from, that's what happens. He's a survivor. Time to show your courage. Time to storm the barricades. Time to fire a shot that will be heard around the world for freedom. He's right. Let's get the Ubers. Come on, let's get the Ubers. Now. Now's the time. Freedom for Earth. For freedom. Harper, you're so cynical, jaded, realistic. No, I was going to say cute. Trance and Harper were visually the youngest characters of the show. Kind of like the kids, you know. Rami's in love with love with Dylan, and she always will be. Dylan and Becca are like the, the two captains, and so maybe one day there'll be tension between them. Um, Tyr on Asazi was, you know, Nietzschean. It would only be with a Nietzschean. Um, and uh, Rev Bem, well, who would be with Rev Bem? He's a, basically a monster and a priest all wrapped up together. Um, so, <laughs> who could be with him? Um, and so, yeah, so it naturally, people seem to think that there would be something with Harper and Trance. And then when Trance, um, by, in season two, I think it was in Ouroboros, when Trance switches places with herself and this much more um, formidable Trance comes to us from the future. Follow me. Follow you? We don't even know you. I'm still trans, and if you would like to get out of here alive, I suggest you do as I say. Harper becomes sort of scared of her, and there's, and there's a lot of conflict that played in the script, and we were trying to figure out why, and Laura and I thought, well, maybe 
Maybe, uh, maybe Harper was in love with Trance. And maybe because that Trance is gone, that's what he's upset about. Maybe that's what all this conflict and all this me being a jerk to Trance is about because my chances are over. Because you've gone and come back from the future and who knows who you are now and blah, blah, blah. So it feels like what had developed was gone. And we played that and it played very nicely. Um, and then, and then the, the word came down from, I don't know if it was Tribune or Fireworks, but I guess those that decide the general overall direction of things um, felt that the show needed more standalone episodes. That we couldn't have heavily, we couldn't heavily accent the arcs that carry through to through. They wanted the show packaged so that each show could stand alone. Not necessarily a bad choice. Star Trek Generation had that format and I loved it. You didn't have to watch them in order until you get to the end of the season. And so, but then they, so, so a lot of stuff like that got kind of um, dropped by the wayside. We then found out later that it worked better for our show to carry the arcs through and we now do carry the arcs through again. Um, and so, uh, so that was sort of like starting over again in season three, you know, midway through season three, season four. So because we are the actors playing these characters and we remember those moments, they're still there and we still try to find opportunities for them. It's just that the opportunities don't come up because it's been so long. So as we head into the home stretch, we'll see where it goes. Obviously something will have to develop with someone, um, but it's likely that for Harper, it will be no one. Again. Don't move. Stay right there. Oh my God, you're hot. Harper, Seamus Harper, nice to- Seamus. What they said. And Harper was always in love with Rami, but then, uh, you know, we also decided that one day, the Harper, the Harper Rami love, it was sort of one of those, I always wanted the episode where for some reason something happened to Rami. Maybe she got a, a bug in her programming, or maybe she felt sorry, sorry for Harper, or for whatever reason, but I always thought there would be the episode where finally Rami says, you know what, Harper? I'll give you a shot. Let's, and then Harper would be like, no, no, right? You know, it's just the chase. It's just the, once that it's finally there, he'd be first of all terrified, and then second of all would have to come to terms in that episode with, oh, I don't feel this way about you. This is weird. And then Harper would have to be the one to sort of dump Rami and say, Rami, I'm sorry, this, this doesn't work, it's not right, I built you. You know, you're more like a, a, a daughter to me than, I, I had it all wrong. And so, but we never did have that episode. I can't help but notice that you engineered my humanoid form with certain features that, strictly speaking, aren't necessary for my normal operations. Ah. Uh. I guess I'm wondering, Harper, when you made this body, who did you do it for? Uh, well, for you, Rami. Absolutely. For... Okay, I know that look too. It means Harper, you're full of it. Uh, technically, for both of us? Oh, really? Okay, Rami, you're taking this all wrong. I mean, for you, uh, because I wanted you to feel the full advantages of being a human woman, you deserve it. And for me, in uh, the capacity of an engineer who prides himself on perfectionism, I just wanted everything to be just right. So, when you handled certain parts of me, did you wear gloves? I've been a writer for a long time. and In our society, we equate success with money. And so you're not a writer until you've been produced, even though really the definition of a writer is someone who writes, right? But that's what all writers have to face. So for me, it was a big hurdle. I got to finally got a few scripts produced and have, have been able to establish, establish myself a little bit as a, a writer and a sci-fi writer, which is a lot of fun. Difficult, but fun. You come up with an idea and you pitch it. And I write as a freelance writer, right? I'm not part of the Andromeda writing staff. You know, they, for them, they have a board and they put up their ideas on the board and they all consult and, and pick which ideas. And sometimes when an idea doesn't work, they'll take that and put it into another episode and move it around. And it's a very collaborative process. And um, they still have to get their ideas approved and then write an outline and get the outline approved. Everything has to get approved step by step by, in our case, Tribune. Um, and uh, <clears throat> as a writer, you're moved back a step. Your stuff has to be approved first by the and writing staff and the head writer, and then by Tribune. So um, as a freelance writer, you take an idea. It's just like, it's a, lo it's a lot like, a, you know, I think pitching movies or pitching anything because you're just trying to get approval. 
And to get that approval, you have to be willing to accept the changes that they want and that they need um, because it's their show. They, they've been in the, that room every week moving the boards around and moving the cards around. And when you have an idea and they're like, oh, we know that idea is already on the board or that idea is going to conflict with this idea. They, they know all that. You don't until you get the scripts. So you have to, you have to pitch an idea, get, get it approved, then write a five-page outline or maybe a three-page outline. Everything has to be kept short. Um, you wait for that to get approved, and then you write your script based on it. And usually, approvals come with notes, so you'll, um, you know, it, it will change a lot over the course. And that's that's how it works. Even with those changes, it's still yours. I mean, you still take those changes, and you still write the thing. You know, a large part. It's just like being a high. You're a freelance writer. You know, it's just like um, working for a magazine. What piece you're told to do, or working for a newspaper. You know, and what what you know what the content of your column is week to week. You do you do have to. Um, you still write it in the end. You still pick those words and those um, circumstances, and you still make it happen. So you still have a, a giant sense of um, accomplishment and ownership of the material. It's much, it's very reward, rewarding, very different from acting. I believe in Seamus Zelazny Harper. I cajito, therefore I sum. And I sum to cajito that damn machine right out of existence. Capiche? I do. Acting is rewarding as well, but it's a completely different beast. I, acting is interpretive. Acting is, you know, you're the brush. You don't get to choose the color. You don't get to choose the canvas. You don't get to choose the picture. You just kind of stroke it all a little bit here and there, right? And everyone strokes your ego. And so, um, but as a writer, you create. Boss, until today, as far as I knew, auroras did not give life. It's incredible, isn't it? Yes. It's beautiful. We are looking at your myth, Mr. Harper. Vault of the heavens. I think your first step when you create a sci-fi is you create your world. You have to know the rules of your world first, and then you put your characters into it. Well, on our show, because our world is the entire universe, there are so many possibilities for rules that it's difficult for that entire universe to seem like a character week to week. That's also part of the show. Like, let's say, um, let's pick another show. Cheers, for example. The bar is a character. You know the bar. You know where the piano is. You know where the back room is. You know where everything is. It's, you can rely on it being the same every week. And you can understand that you know, the restaurant upstairs, the owner of the restaurant, is a, you know, is, gives them a hard time. And whenever Sam goes running out, you don't have to see that restaurant. You've gotten to know it. Um, well, it, with an entire universe as your world, that can be very difficult. So this season, because we're stuck in a place, all of a sudden, a bigger sense of place exists, and it does become a character, a very large part of the story. Um, and it, it's really interesting. It seems and feels like we're going more places, even though we're stuck in one place. It's that, that whole dichotomy of restricting creativity again. Since you're in such a good mood, why don't we say drinks are on the house for the rest of the night until you pass out? Are you making fun of me? No, not you specifically. But the day is still young. Good timing. You're gonna want to let go of him. We've had lots of outtakes, more than have even made it to the DVDs or the reels. It's been there's been a lot of goofing around, and there there's one thing in particular that Lisa Ryder, you should ask her during her interview, has the mouth of a sewer. Sometimes she messes up. I don't know if you could, you know, with, attach it to this and show and show a little bit, but if you can, show it now and turn the volume down and put lots of beeps. You'll hear lots of beeps of uh, Lisa Ryder messing up. Me. It's very funny. She gets so concentrated on the moment and then... Serious. She doesn't mess up a lot, but when she does. So that's always been very funny. Uh, last week, there's an, there's an outtake. I shouldn't mention it because I'm not in the, sh in the shape I used to be in, but I have to take off my shirt and scratch my back. You're supposed to see that there's uh, a rash there. But what I did was I got the wardrobe guy to make um, furry pasties with tassels, and I taped them to my man chest and um, <laughs> took off my shirt and started dancing for the camera. So. For that's in there somewhere, too. There have been lots of funny things. <laughs> Fans exists in all genres. I think that's just that there's something about sci-fi that 
it doesn't have to be great for you to love it, you know? On other shows, there is fandom, but it's always, it's always you know, a, a specific small group. But in sci-fi, you can cross over between all the different shows because you're just getting your dose of sci-fi because it can be very hard to find. So there's an extra level of appreciation that they give you just for doing sci-fi. <laughs> and I know this because as a sci-fi fan, I've watched some pretty crappy movies <laughs> twice. <laughs> just so I could get my fix of bad props and costumes and aliens, just so I could get my dose. Um, and so there's not enough out there. So there's that, it's, it's a neat thing. And they've been great. Andromeda fans have been really great um, at all the conventions. You know, you, you hear stories of uh, problems that people have had. I think, you know, Kevin, um, Kevin Sorbo as, as Hercules, which was a much larger fan base to begin with, and also because he was running around in a loincloth, <laughs> showing a lot of skin, you know, there are, people have seen a lot more of you, and so you're more bound to have people. Um, I've never been a sex symbol, let's say, so I've never had to deal with that aspect of it, <laughs> to try and put it mildly. So, um, so yeah, it's been great. No one's ever asked me to run around in a loincloth. Wonder why. <laughs>